I'm John Hallett, and I'm a sculptor. He's many <laughs> mediums from clay and styrofoam to natural objects to cast pieces primarily in metal and glass. Over the next 10 minutes, or 10 and a half, see, but I'm going to share how I got here, some significant artistic influences, my experimentation over the last three semesters, and where I'm headed. My art career started in high school with jewelry production, wheel throwing, and hand building pottery. And that was in the late 1970s, but not as early as Kevin. I took a detour from art for a few decades to help people and animals as a veterinarian. And while running our animal hospital, I took sculpture classes at the University of Wisconsin Whitewater and sculpted realistic figures relating to my family. I started with timber sports athletes, cross country skiers, and eventually veterinarians and animals. This bronze sculpture detailing my experiences in veterinary school was just installed at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and is a prime example of my realistic figurative work prior to coming to MCAD. My focus at MCAD still relates to family, but has shifted to trees as they relate to family. I think trees are incredible. They can be large or small and can live to be thousands of years old. And as this slide shows, trees and family are taking me in many directions. Some of my earliest memories are of exploring the white pine forest around our Rhode Island home with my brother, Rich, who cites our shared early experiences in the woods as being formative in his desire to become a research scientist with the US Forest Service. We both remember climbing into huge white pine trees and sliding down their soft branches, letting them catch us and gently place us on the ground below. This probably has something to do with our decades long dedication to lumberjack sports as well. I coach log rolling and Rich is a timber sports judge and we are both former professional log rollers. The photo on the left shows us in New York City a few weeks ago in Washington Square Park, collecting a mold from Hangman's Elm, the oldest tree in Manhattan. My brother in uniform was especially helpful answering questions from spectators while I was making my molds. People are very protective of their trees. As I collect molds from trees, I've been pleased to find that people all over the world have a special relationship with trees. My father introduced me to the marvels of the outdoors and to artists and environmentalists, and he assists me in the woods. Here he is helping me make a mold of the beaver tree, and he works pretty fast for being in his 80s. I also want to mention my mother who passed away almost 20 years ago, and she really set the stage for this idea of going back to school later in life. In her 60s, she went to the seminary earning her master's and PhD. My father also invited me into his Twin Cities home while I attend MCAD, since my home is five hours away. My wife and business partner, Heidi, inspires me with her poetry and paintings and helps me collect molds and trees from faraway places. Our son, Torrance, a post symphony performer, inspires me with his music and invites us to visit places like Mexico and New York, where we can see interesting trees and hear him perform. And our son, Tanner, the rocket engineer, who helps make my sculptures respond to touch. I like people to touch and fully experience my sculptures and often make the sculptures respond with lighter sound when touched. This tree bark projects dappled green light on the wall behind it when it's touched. My great-great-grandfather, John Hallett, might also have something to do with my interest in casting metal. He founded Hallett Ironworks in the 1800s in Chicago. Artistic influences include the French sculptor Auguste Rodin, who had a big influence on my early sculptures. I eventually realized that although he started with a hyper-realistic style, he later embraced sculpting his interpretation of the world. Contemporary artist uh, from Spain, Cristina Iglesias, examines what is underneath the ground, transforming it into bronze and sharing it with the world. Here she depicts a stream that historically ran through Madison Square Park in New York City. She makes the invisible 
visible, depicting a memory that the landscape might have. Other artists that have inspired me include those who share their passion for the environment through writing and environmental activism. Scottish-born American John Muir was known as the father of the national parks. And Sigurd F. Olson, who lived near our Wisconsin cabin, was instrumental in the creation of one of my favorite places, the Boundary Waters of Northern Minnesota. Both had legislative impacts in preserving wilderness by making the wilderness areas familiar to the general public. Contemporary author Richard Powers presents scientific research in his novel, The Overstory, which speaks from the perspective of trees and explains how trees share nutrients and communicate with each other through underground fungal networks. I've always thought that trees are magical and share energy with people, but this idea of communicating with each other is amazing. And some live for thousands of years. Just imagining what they have experienced has led me to picture what tree memories might look like if they were depicted in my art and to wonder how I can make trees more familiar to people, like family. Much like these artists, my primary studio is the outdoors. That's where my ideas begin, where I collect my molds and where I feel grounded. I bring those ideas and molds to my MCAD studio and to the foundry as I create my sculptures. Here, we're pouring molten bronze into a ceramic shell mold of the beaver tree. I've also been experimenting with installations that tell stories about looking at things from different perspectives. For example, the beaver tree can signal a healthy fire resistant forest to an environmentalist, while it can signal property destruction and flooding to a small landowner. A standing block cut by an ax could represent deforestation and destruction, or it might represent historical reenactment or even entertainment using a renewable resource. A sense of wonder and a connection with nature pervades my installations as I convert the energy that trees share with me into something that is visible and palpable. Cross country skiing is a favorite family activity. After making woodblock prints of winter pine trees and a skier, I poured molten bronze into the woodblock, yielding two abstract pieces, one of charred wood and the other of bronze. My studio research has involved experimenting with different mold and casting materials like plaster, cement, silicone, ceramic shell, clay, paper, glass, and even salt. I may come from the data-driven medical world, but I prefer depicting my families about few, about depicting my feelings about family, trees, and environment, environmental issues, rather than depicting data. After reading a paper that my brother published on the effects of salt water from Hurricane Sandy on the trees of Brooklyn and Queens, I cast maple tree bark in crumbling salt, illustrating the idea that some trees, like red maple, can readily adapt to this consequence of climate change, while others can't. Reaching back to my roots in jewelry production, I've been casting bark in tree bark in glass to set in bronze bases that are reminiscent of jewelry settings. The cast glass is strong yet fragile, like the environment. Casting glass has opened the door to using color. Like flowers that use color to attract birds and insects, I use color to attract viewers, hoping that they will explore my work in more detail once they are drawn close. Color also helps convey the emotions that I feel when I'm outdoors. For example, after visiting the Greek temple ruins of Selenunte in Sicily last summer, I depicted them in glass tree bark, colored blue like the Mediterranean Sea and Sicilian sky. The glass temple was created using a mold from a 4,000 year old chestnut tree on the nearby slopes of Etna. Incredibly, the 100 horse chestnut as it is known was alive when the Greek temples were built in Sicily and is still alive now. This will be part of a larger bronze, glass, and petrified wood sculpture next semester. My name is John Hallett. I'm a sculptor. My vision is to use art to bring people together in conversation about trees and the environment. I make the forest familiar, like family. I plan on continuing my exploration of glass and bronze in larger sculptures suitable for public 
art viewed in both indoor and outdoor settings. Thank you. Any similarities between the cartoon figures and the two on the left is uh, purely intentional. <laughs> <laughs> We've got time for questions. Liz. Can you talk more about the material you use to make your molds? Like what exactly you're using and are they safe for the trees and all that? Yes, yes, good question. Um, the materials that I use to create my molds, I've, I've done a lot of experimenting with uh, last year. I settled on a silicone putty material that um, is food safe. And the best mold release for that is actually water. So I wet the tree down and then mix the putty and put it on the tree. And depending on which type of putty I use, in about eight minutes, I can peel it off. And, um, and then I've got my mold that I can take back home. Um, some of the other mold materials I use, some other more liquid uh, silicones, would peel off um, the moss and lichens from the trees. I experimented with those on my own trees. And um, a year later, there are still some indications of where that, that mold material was uh, had peeled things off. And so um, I even, um, well, I tried a, a several different materials. How do you, oh, no, you please go. Bellini. How do you choose the trees that you decide to capture um, birds? How do I choose the trees? That's another good question. Um, uh, it, it tends to do with where I am with family, uh, whether I'm visiting family or traveling with family. Um, uh, there are a number of sites on the internet that, that list old and significant, historically significant trees. Um, sometimes it's just a tree that that um, that I see that is just amazing to me. Um, sometimes it's a tree on our own property. So um, some of these trees have their own websites, and uh, which is which is kind of cool. Uh, there's a, there's a question in the chat. Is it is it difficult to get access to the trees? Oh, good question too. Is it difficult to get access to the trees? Um, most of the time, I try to get permission. Um, to to take a mold from a tree, um, especially like the hundred horse chestnut, um, which is pictured in the background here. And so I wrote the mayor of San Alfio in Sicily, didn't hear anything back. So then I wrote the tourism department of this small town and they connected me with Alfio Macaroni, who is the caretaker of the tree. And he unlocks the gate and he was very gracious in inviting me in and going over the rope and people started yelling at us and he told them to be quiet in Italian. And, and then this school teacher friend of his drove along and jumped out of her car and he was so happy to introduce us. Um, and I've kept in touch with, with Alfio, um, showing him the, the work that, um, that I've done based on that tree. And, um, also, uh, um, through uh, a friend of ours in Italy, we were introduced to Enrico Calvi on the left, who's a forester. And he drove us, he doesn't speak much English, but he drove us up into the Alps and, and we stopped on a corner and picked up um, Alfio Domenghini, who's the head of the Chestnut Growers Association in Avarara, Italy. And, and he took us on this hike up into the Alps and showed us the chestnut grove they're restoring. and. Um, and I've kept in touch with him as well. So making these connections with other people that are energized by trees is is um, a really awesome byproduct. Kevin. John, is there a particular, uh, well, you've experimented with so many materials over the past year and a half. And I'm curious if, they, if you have found one that resonates most with your, with the, how, how your art correlates with your sense of family. That is, if there is a material that mediates that, that, that sort of sensation of uh, how your work relates to your family. Boy. Well, the, the bronze goes back to family history with my great-great-grandfather and great-grandfather. Um, great-grandfather on my other side was a blacksmith. Um, so I think the metal but I'm really drawn to the glass because of the depth that it that it gives and how you can look inside it. And um, I'll be experimenting next semester with some reflective uh, 
silvering of the glass, which will then, um, allow my family members to see themselves. So it, it all, I think it's really in the origin of the piece is where the family relation comes in rather than the material, the materiality of it. <clears throat> Thanks, John. Great.